Thanks for having me. It's great to be back at Roger Williams. Uh, uh, it's always one of the more interesting conversations I ever experienced, and this, in a way, has been, uh, after yesterday, a very tough act to follow, a very heavy discussion, uh, and it compelled me to make some significant adjustments to my presentation um, that I hope will contribute to the extension of this conversation in interesting ways. Um, the first thing I've added uh, that I hope will be useful in this dialogue was triggered by the mention of metaphor, the trouble of the problem of metaphor, the role of inscriptions and in monuments, and uh, several other things that uh, I realized was an excellent way to get to the discussion that I really want to have, and that is something that's been suggested in several presentations yesterday, and that is the role of the human body, uh, the, the platform of all experience, and how that is useful in consideration of how we do what we do in the design of uh, physical uh, manifestations of big ideas, uh, whether it's monuments or uh, something else, the challenge that was uh, put before us yesterday was how to move beyond the passive character of memorializing something that happened in the past. And of course, that is anything but passive. Uh, we know that you can't do anything. We were reminded yesterday that just to brush your teeth, you need to have memory. Uh, without the recollection uh, of the past, you are incapable of doing anything. But I hope by the end of this uh, to share with you something that uh, Manuel Delgado has taught me about in the past few years uh, about how architecture can actually uh, be a proactive uh, tool instrument for doing some of the things that were suggested especially by Julian yesterday. Um, so the first stop along this path is the writing of Nelson Goodman, uh, not an architect, a philosopher. In 1988, he published an essay called How Buildings Mean. And uh, after studying for decades uh, French philosophers trying to grapple with one small part or another small part of this question, uh, I come back to Nelson Goodman as a very clear thinker who is capable of presenting these issues in a way that my students and I can deal with uh, on a very pragmatic level. Um, so basically, it boils down to four, he, he identifies four mechanisms of how buildings mean. And I'm starting in the wrong place, aren't I? Don't look. OK. So the first way, uh, and he uses the Lincoln Memorial usefully enough for our discussion. Uh, as the demonstration of how buildings mean. The, the first way buildings mean is very explicitly through denotation. His word is denotation. We use language to literally say what we mean. Uh, and to inscribe them in buildings, we literally have the buildings uh, convey through language what it means. So the Gettysburg Address and other inscriptions in the Lincoln Memorial uh, get straight to a very direct denotation of meaning. Uh, the second way is through exemplification. And exemplification is the big one. Uh, this is what we teach our students. This is what we mean when we refer to uh, experience of space and place. And it's the one that uh, I think that uh, many of us would argue is the primary and most powerful um, operation of generating meaning and it occurs at multiple scales uh, including the scale of the city. Anyone arriving at this place uh, would be struck by the importance of this larger-than-life figure sitting on his throne in this uh, impressively scaled building. Uh, and so more on this later because this is the one that uh, has the most to do with the human body and our experience. Um, the third one is metaphor. There are whole uh, systems of meaning that are conveyed through our educational systems, through uh, 
uh, the conveyance of cultural meanings. Uh, from the time we're born uh, to the time we die, we are taking in newer versions and negotiating new versions of cultural meanings. And the negotiation of cultural meaning is one of the big things we do as a society, uh, whether we're consuming, advertising, producing uh, stories, uh, national identities, ethnic identities, identity constructions are often uh, metaphorical uh, in nature uh, because meanings are often constructed in relationship to prior meanings and metaphor is a powerful way to do that. We know what a Greek column means uh, through our cultural mechanisms. Uh, and then finally and this is the one that takes us away from architecture and gives us uh, a sense of humility in the face of human events, uh, especially in things um, that we talked about yesterday. Things happen in places independent of any uh, intentions of designers or clients or funders or anybody. Things happen and meanings shift because of the events of history. And so um, all of these uh, mechanisms are clearly uh, demonstrated in uh, Nelson Goodman's uh, use of the Lincoln Memorial uh, and becomes the basis for uh, further uh, extensions of meanings where uh, architecture becomes a powerful vehicle for conveying meanings of a society, whether it's national uh, interest or not. Uh, I want to extend um, for a moment uh, some of these ideas by one more idea. Um, well, first of all, just to reinforce this, the World Trade Center towers meant something, meant different things at different times. Uh, and for much of their existence, they represented uh, the hubris of power um, to those who uh, lamented their impact on Lower Manhattan. Um, but of course, that will not be the meaning that um, is uh, that is extended uh, forward in time. Um, the important addition to Nelson Goodman, and, and here this is starting down the path of his second uh, method of meaning construction, which is exemplification, what he calls exemplification, uh, but what uh, we uh, have a much larger, richer language, I believe, uh, to describe. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning the power of place itself, that the pilgrimage networks of uh, the early Christian Europe, uh, what drove the pilgrims uh, to visit places was not simply the indulgences they would be granted um, as a reward for their suffering, but to stand in the presence of the actual physical reality of the relic that is being visited. Uh, it it uh, points to the power of a concept uh, that we call presentia, that by simply having the actual relic in our presence, Somehow there's an exchange of molecules that we breathe the air uh, and uh, shed the skin cells. And there's something about the physical presence that uh, has a power that in a way defies uh, description linguistically. But through our actions, we exemplify how important it is to be actually physically present. Some of us have doubts about online learning courses in part because of this. Um, but certainly the power of actually being in a place is something that is not lost on many of us. Uh, and some would argue, <clears throat> have argued that you shouldn't present something in lecture that you haven't actually experienced physically in, in, in a spatial experience, in part because of the importance of not just consuming these places visually and remotely or through narrative descriptions, but in the body. Um, now, this is where we make a leap uh, to, uh, to that one of those French people that I said we didn't need to talk about. But um, 
Pierre Bourdieu actually uh, presents a very useful set of ideas uh, when we talk about the human body and uh, very much adds to um, this second category of Nelson Goodman of exemplification. In his anthropological research in North Africa, he points out the, uh, the importance of the physical environment, the form of the physical environment. Um, and this was uh, the point of origin of his concept of the word that um, Renata used uh, about an hour and a half ago, uh, habitus. The, uh, the power of the structure of a physical space to have uh, on our mental constructions. So the physical space is not just something out there on its own, independent of our embodied mind. It actually, there is a dialogue, there's a constant dialogue between our mental structures and the physical structures. And the uh, phenomenon that he observed that led him to articulate this idea is the, uh, the networks of pathways in the village of Kabilia, in the highlands of the mountains of colonial Algeria, where he noticed that uh, the women uh, stayed in the house, uh, stayed in the house until uh, the men would go to the fields. And it was only after the men had left the village that the women would go to collect water. Uh, and, uh, but when the, when the women needed to collect water, when the men were in the village, it resulted in a secondary network of back alleyways, which were the appropriate paths for the women to take. And uh, the collection of water was something that um, occupied a great deal of time and effort. Uh, and so it was actually a significant portion of the human labor of the village. And uh, the physical structure of the, of the village was, uh, in a way, the instrument that uh, created this sense of the gender definition uh, and these cultural practices of the society of the village. And it was really this example that led him to speculate on this connection between the structure of physical space and our mental structures that we carry around with us. And so habitus is the word that is used to refer to those mental physical, the relationship between mental physical structures. Um, and, uh, and it becomes quite useful uh, in uh, considering the notions of how these operations continue in the present where the body, uh, the bodily experience of architecture uh, is not an insignificant factor in how buildings mean and getting back to this uh, the four-part uh, structure the categorization by Nelson Goodman um, and from here we go to the architectural photography of Iwan Bon uh, you may or may not have heard of Iwan Bon a Dutch photographer uh, but you have seen his photos there is no uh, well-known architect today who has not had his work presented through the medium of Iwan Bon's vision and his the lens of his camera. And, but Iwan Bon has become famous uh, because of or in spite of, you, you can decide for yourself, um, the breaking of two significant taboos of architectural culture. The first taboo uh, that he breaks is that he uh, thinks of himself as a portrait photographer. He takes photographs of people and he credits as his influence uh, famous portrait photographers much more often than any uh, architectural photographers. And so his, um, his work uh, focuses on people in the rarefied spaces of, of architectural creation. Um, the second taboo he breaks is he does not frame the idealized objects of uh, architecture um, tightly. Uh, he frames, he allows the urban space of the city to frame uh, the architecture that he's looking at. So with that as a prologue, I'm going to uh, take us to two examples. And I told Dylan I wouldn't repeat what I presented to his class, but I changed my mind. Um, 
when I found myself uh, working with the king of Java in the palace in central Java, uh, one of the first things I noticed is the buildings themselves were not very um, preservation worthy. They were uh, quite decrepit. And, but what made the palace very special is the shock that I got when I arrived to find that there was actually a king and a court and princes and, and queens and a set of religious practices that still charged uh, this architecture to the present day as if it were uh, the, uh, several centuries ago. And so the continuity of these practices uh, were startling to me. The other thing that startled me is the imminent implementation of a colonial Williamsburg approach to the preservation of this palace, where the royal family and all those living bodies uh, that were uh, enervating the spaces, the religious, the authentic religious practices that continued to the present, were about to be displaced as the royal family was invited to move out to the gated community suburbs so that the palace could be properly preserved following the guidelines established by colonial Williamsburg and the actors would replace the royal family and, um, to a more effective entertainment value of the tourist. Um, and shopping malls would occupy the space of the former Dutch uh, uh, fortress, etc. You can imagine the rest. Um, and so I was in the right place at the right time to uh, help develop uh, an alternative model based on not so much the tourist value, not so much the uh, value of the buildings, but the value of the living practices of the people that continue to energize the palace to the present day, I'm, I'm happy to say. And so it was the ability to transform uh, found objects and uh, cultural importations from Europe, where this Baroque Dutch carriage became Kiai Goruda Kenchono, the sacred uh, conveyance of, um, of the gods of the Hindu Javanese cosmology uh, and the incorporation of the Baroque architecture of the palace, the brass band, uh, the fez, uh, the Dutch tuxedo coats with the uh, tails clipped to accommodate the uh, Javanese sword and the batik skirt. Uh, all of these things were Javanized, the most, one of the most important verbs of Javanese language and culture. Uh, refers to the process of incorporation and legitimization of these cultural artifacts, including the mosque, which uh, developed out of the Hindu uh, architecture. And here we have the Javanese mosque, the commemoration of Muhammad's ascension, uh, using the Hindu uh, linga yoni symbols of these offerings uh, in a hybrid formation that continues to have meaning such that the young men uh, rip it to pieces uh, and take it home. Um, I'm going to move quickly through the role of the palace as an instrument of restoring the balance between heaven and earth. Uh, the water wa used to wash the buildings is uh, greedily gathered up by the women to take back home and spread on their children if they ever get sick. Um, the uh, ritual circumambulation of the palace on the Javanese New Year um, uh, to restore the balance between heaven and earth. And it strikes uh, a comparison not so much to colonial Williamsburg, uh, where there's the resurrection of uh, heritage, even if you have to kill it in order to resurrect it. Uh, it. It's more likely to be compared, or more usefully compared, to the Issei Shrine, where the actual living culture of its reconstruction in a cyclical pattern every several decades uh, is uh, the building itself, the material, is not old. It is constantly renewed. It is the living tradition and culture of the renewal that is of value, and which brought us to the embodied value of the king, where the king uh, is the source of legitimacy. Uh, despite, I mean, he's also a human being. He hangs out in the bar at nights and uh, flirts with the young ladies and tells jokes in Dutch, but he is also simultaneously um, the, the focal point of these ongoing traditions. And so when we did our work in preparation for the uh, Aga Khan Award for Architecture Ceremony, um, we performed all of these rituals, uh, largely embodied, at least when it comes to the reconstruction, uh, 
in the carpenter priest architect um, who is simultaneously the workman who creates uh, the physical fabric, uh, renews the physical fabric, um, but also a priest and uh, noble in the court of the palace. Uh, which brings us to how could you draw that? Uh, one of the things I've been working with my students on is how to draw the operation of human bodies in architectural space. And we look at Italian futurist painting, uh, we look at uh, Holly White studies, um, how bodies um, invigorate space, and what is the relationship between architecture and uh, the uh, actions and bodies and humans and activities that architecture frames. Uh, the architect Norman um, David Rockwell um, collaborated with the choreographer to try to uh, find a way of notating these spaces um, and of course the political power of the body in space is something that has been effectively captured uh, in film and video um, not least of which is this uh, uh, documentation of power uh, and and I say power deliberately to avoid the word politics because um, this is uh, something that transcends the petty uh, machinations of politics that we were referring to in our conversation last night. Um, but how do you capture the power of the human body in space? Um, it partly it has to do with the larger setting. Uh, certainly this framing of the events, uh, Tiananmen Square, um, adds to the power. Um, these, the raised eye point is crucial. Uh, Schindler's List, um, uh, Spielberg uh, uses the same raised eye level of uh, Schindler and his wife looking down on the city and the color coding of an otherwise uh, black and white scene to document the spatial um, movement of one body in the midst of many bodies and eventually becomes one of the most important icons of the film. And uh, besides these highly charged moments in history, there is a day-to-day -day ritual of bodies in space that um, because, and one of the contributions of Bourdieu is to help us see things that we would otherwise uh, experience in, as invisible background realities, uh, somehow natural. Um, but the natural operation of bodies in the space of a market um, throughout much of the world is something that has been uh, disrupted uh, profoundly by the introdu introduction of automobiles. And uh, this is the work of uh, photographer Martin Romers uh, documenting some of these interactions in space, trying to capture the motion of bodies in space in competition with uh, automobiles. This is another uh, attempt to capture it uh, uh, a collaboration between William Forsythe, the famous dancer and choreographer, with the Ohio State University Computer Science uh, Laboratory to uh, develop new methods of capturing um, space, which actually um, incorporating computer um, methods um, have generated some quite intriguing work. Um, one of my informants on this is uh, a painter, choreographer, dancer who studied neuroscience uh, and is now at MIT, uh, who has very much looked at methods of these types of methods, but at the same time, the emerging neuroscience that indicates that the, the Cartesian split between mind and body is a false construct, that actually uh, the, the body uh, is part of all human experience and that there is the body is not just something that gets our brains to meetings uh, although we might behave that way um, our brains are uh, are part of the body they are an organ and uh, it is one mind-body system and so the neuroscience coming out of uh, the new brain scanning techniques in a way are confirming much of the aesthetic theory um, of the earlier time and I just want to take uh, another moment just to look at this one example um, that responds to the 
prospect of how knowing what we know and knowing what we have learned from uh, how memorials operate, how do we then do something besides simply memorialize, and there's nothing simple about it, but can we do something more proactively to uh, use what we know uh, about power and architecture and space uh, to alter outcomes ahead of time? Um, and so uh, I showed this to my students, and we often say, ah, oh, very interesting building. But the situation matters, and the barriers to the human body um, make a difference. And so uh, this takes me to uh, Medellin, Colombia, where Manuel Delgado introduced me to a situation. Um, Medellin uh, is well known as the murder capital of the world, uh, peaking in 1991 with 381 homicides per 100,000 people. Um, the gains by the national military against the drug lords uh, were followed up by um, this activist mayor who uh, campaigned for uh, mayor of Medellin by putting his body in space. He did not travel by bulletproof glass uh, car. He walked through the neighborhoods of the city and um, won his victory. And when he won, his, he's the son of a famous architect and um, he mobilized a team of architect planners who for uh, many years had been developing proposals for what to do if uh, they had the chance. And what they did is they mapped the dead bodies. They made a map of where all the dead bodies were piling up. And instead of building the state-of-the-art facilities and transportation system that had been planned for the wealthiest neighborhoods, they took those same plans off the shelf and they implemented them in the locations where the most bodies were piling up. And so this was ground zero for the uh, death and destruction of the drug cartels. And they built a state-of-the-art uh, library park and um, uh, a cable car transportation system to uh, connect this neighborhood to the rest of the city and society. And it's a tremendous transformation without replacing the housing. Uh, and it's more than a library and it's more than a park. It's really the center of a much larger campaign for education and retraining of the workforce to be productive uh, members of society so that um, the demobilized drug warriors with a fourth grade education, but uh, they're very good at using the AK-47 that they brought back from the drug wars, did not turn to crime. Instead, they turned to uh, new opportunities the uh, rivalries between different neighborhoods were brought together, not by this, just this imposition of this infrastructure, but by the ground up participation in the process of reconnecting uh, the two neighborhoods. So now it's very much like a hill town in Italy. Uh, the, the buildings are quite simple, not much changed, but transformed by the dignity granted by the architecture. And I think this speaks directly to Julian's uh, challenge and presentation. Um, it has become one of the uh, tourist destinations of Latin America. Um, the orange line is the murder rate in Medellin compared with other Colombian cities. The primary uh, factor in the demobilization of the drug forces, the drug wars, were the military but how to keep the crime and murder rate down uh, as these drug warriors return to the cities. Uh, this is a museum of science, uh, the public art of by Botero downtown, and the openness of these library parks. Uh, five were built uh, in the first term. Uh, a second mayor took over. The, we're in the third uh, mayor now. But it's the connection between the neighborhood and these facilities. Uh, the bodily connection that allows the people to occupy these spaces, give them uh, the dignity and the opportunity to establish local life um, without the dislocation of the new housing, making uh, these two situations um, something more like night and day than uh, a gradual, any gradual, subtle transformation. So I've gone over time, so I'm going to end it there. Thank you.